Howdy, how are y'all doing today with a new episode here on Spotty Sports. I have an interview today. It's actually a bucket list interview of mine. He is a, has six major career wins. He won the Bassmaster Tournament, Bassmaster Classic Tournament in 2008 on Lake Hartwell in South Carolina. He has 56 top 10s, 98 top 20s. Now I present Alton Jones. Hey, how you doing today, Nicholas? Good, how are you? How are you? Good, good. I'm glad, glad to be with you. Thank Ready you. Ready to talk some fishing. And me too. It's an, it's an honor to be talking to you right now. Yeah, well, uh, so uh, so t tell me, when did you get started? Here I am interviewing you now. How long, have you been fishing your whole life? Well, I mean, my dad grew up in Greece, and he's been fishing pretty much his whole life. He's not into it as much as me, but my grandpa on my mom's side, he was a major fly fisherman, loves fly fishing. Okay. So, I you know, I wasn't really much of a fly fisherman, but through fly fishing, it took me into bass fishing, saltwater fishing, just all types of fishing. So, right. Yep. But now they don't have bass in Greece, do they? I, I know Italy, they do. In Italy, they do. But um, my, my dad, you know, he was, he moved from Greece to Galveston. So he was saltwater fish. So okay. him fishing and my grandpa fishing and then all my friends fishing just kind of brought me together to pretty much just be bass fishing and saltwater fishing. I gotcha. I gotcha. Right. And um, so if, uh, if you didn't mind, I was going to go ahead and ask you a couple questions. Sure. Okay. So as an accomplished fisherman or as an accomplished professional fisherman as you are, what would you tell me or any other beginning bass fisherman on how to focus and how to gain to the next level? Well, I think um, the most important thing is to put yourself in a position in your tournaments where you're making all the decisions and spend as much time on the water as you possibly can. You know, there's a lot of value in, in, of course, reading and looking at things on the web and watching YouTube, but the real value is in time that you spend with a rod and reel in your hand on the lake doing it. Um, there is no substitute at all for time on the water. And, um, you know, that's, that's probably, I mean, there's no shortcuts, I, I guess is what I'm saying. It's, it, it takes a, commitment and a lot of hard work and that that work happens uh you know when you're out there on the lake so that's that's really the the, the main key the, the other thing is it really has to be your passion you know any anything else um it li like any other career that somebody chooses for example they're not going to be very successful at it if it's not the thing they're most passionate about you know i want a doctor taking care of me who's a passionate doctor Right, right. You know, if my house catches on fire, I want the firefighter that comes to my house to be a passionate one, someone who he lives to fight fires. And that's kind of that's kind of how we need to be with fishing. It really needs to be one of the just one of one of the driving influences in our life to to be successful at it. And if you I think if you've got that uh, drive within you uh, and uh, spend a lot of time doing it, you're going to going to improve. Right. I t totally, totally agree with there. And uh... My mom, my mom always tells me, Nicholas, you like fishing and uh, not catching because uh, when I bring my little brother out fishing, all he wants to do is just catch the fish, and then my mom will tell him, "You're there to fish, not to catch." Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's exactly right. And of course, catching it certainly enhances the fishing part. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that's that's. It's not that catching is not an important part, but but yeah, I see. I enjoy fishing. To me, I think one of the things that drives me is the search. I mean, I love catching fish, but I also love uh, kind of putting together the puzzle and figuring out, you know, everyday bass fishing is something different. You have to figure out something different you haven't, that you have to learn. And I think uh, the process of, of putting it together is one of the things that really drives me. Right. It's like a, it's like a jigsaw puzzle you got to put together and just bring all the pieces together to catch that yeah. fish. I mean, no two days of bass fishing are exactly alike. I, you know, you could fish the exact same lake today and do well in the exact same lake tomorrow, but you're going to have to figure out at least something a little bit different. Maybe it's a new area. Maybe it's a new technique. Maybe you're in the same area with the same bait, but there's there's a different way today that you have to work the bait to, to get them to, to bite it really good, or maybe it's a color change. You know, there's always something that you've got to figure out um, in order to uh, up your game. Right, right. That makes sense. It's a, it's a thinking man's game. That, that, is, that is true. That is true. And um, so, um, as we talked before, on November 13th and 14th, there's a border bass battle in Del Rio, Texas, uh, more specifically Lake Amistad, which is, it's a 
Lake on the Border. I'm, I'm sure you know Lake on the Border is between Mexico and Texas. And this is my first bass fishing tournament. So it's a little nerve wracking, scary, a whole bunch of different emotions just, you know, running through my body. And what would you, if, if someone, if I, me asking you or someone else asking you, what would you do to prepare for the first tournament? And what would you, would you focus on one thing the whole time or would you move around or how would you, what would you do? Well, um, that's a, there's so many aspects to that question. Let me, can I take just a second and tell you the story of my first bass tournament? Let's go ahead and listen to that, yeah. My first bass tournament was the Waco Bass Club in 19, let me think, let me get my year right, 1985. And in that particular tournament, I had learned to fish on, on private lakes uh, in over in East Texas, and I was pretty good at catching bass but I really didn't have any experience on public lakes or experience finding fish. And I went to that tournament, me and my partner, and it was on Lake Belton here in central Texas. And okay. we, we fished hard all day and we caught zero. And I knew it was just a tough day and I knew the guys weren't going to catch much. And we got to the weigh-in and it was one of those days that everybody smashed them. I mean, it was just a catch fest, everybody but us. And there we were standing there with an empty bag and everybody, everybody else had, you know, there was five pounders coming across the scales left and right. <clears throat> and that was a big eye-opening eye -opening, uh, day for me to real, realizing that I had a lot to learn and that fishing on a private lake is totally different than fishing in public waters. Yeah, that, that, that is true. Um, so uh, basically, I actually, so I fished one bass club tournament and dropped out of the club and uh, determined that, hey, I'm going to learn how to fish public lakes before I ever enter another tournament. And I, it wasn't for another year. I took a whole year and did nothing but just just fish a bunch of public lakes and figure out how to catch some fish. And the next year, um, my partner and I, or the, a year later, we signed up for Waco Bass Club again, and, and we won Anglers of the Year that year. Um, so I guess my, my point in telling you that is practice is what makes perfect in right. that. Um, and even, even down on a more micro level, just for your first tournament and for your tournament in Del Rio, what's going to make you successful or not is, is how well you practice. Preparation is always more important than game day. Preparation is the day that you set your foundation for what you're going to do. You know, I, I have some ideas of, of, of things that I think the fish might be doing in Del Rio, but I wouldn't know unless I would have to go down there and figure out what they're really doing now. You know, I, I need to go spend – a couple of days on the water to figure out what baits they're biting, what depth they're in, what colors they want. Are they looking up feeding? Are they looking down feeding? Um, what part of the lake is on? Where can I get a little bit bigger fish? What's the vegetation like? You know, there's all kinds of things I'm looking at as I go there. But spending time out there big, getting prepared for that event is what would really set the stage for it. Um, you know, this time of year, you you can do well shallow over there. I would expect though that that tournament's going to get one out a little bit, a little bit deeper. Okay, okay, that's that, that's definitely good to know. <laughs> and so also, um, my roommate, who not necessarily, not necessarily got me into bass fishing, but he would, he's a huge bass fisherman. Me, me and him are both big bass fishermen, but he's the he doesn't like the saltwater fish. He's just straight bass fishing. That's just all he does. And so he really, he was one to open my eyes when I was in middle school and then going into high school about what actually bass fishing was. And so he wanted me to ask you a specific question and uh, what's your go-to lure? And if you were to wake up and go fishing one day, what would you put in your backpack? Just a couple, a couple of lures, just like some, I don't know, just your favorite lure. Yeah, well, probably my go-to lure um, actually is, is a little bit different than what a lot of people, a lot of people might assume it, assume it is, but it's probably a jig. If I, if I was, uh, you know, that's a bait that when I get in trouble, a lot of times you'll see me go to a jig. That, that's how you know what your go-to lure is. That's that's the lure that you kind of default to when you can't make anything else work. Right, right. Because, you know, because I've got confidence in that bait. One of the things I like about a jig is it's so versatile. You know, you can fish it on the bottom like, like soft plastics or like a traditional jig uh, type fishing, but you can also swim it. Um, you can buzz it through uh, surface vegetation. You can you can do so many different things with it. You fish it fast. You can fish it slow. You can crawl it across the bottom. You can you can stroke it and jump it up off the up off, off the bottom. Um, and, and there's just so many different ways that you can use a jig as a tool. 
Um, so that's probably um, my number one. If I if I was just going to take a backpack, and I, I think your question was, what what are some things I would make sure I would have in my backpack? Yes. Um, I think so. Well, let's start with uh, let's start with just some bait. So we also uh, already mentioned jigs, um, you know, and I would have a variety of different weights, all the way from lightweight ones like a quarter ounce, all the way up to like a like a three quarter or even a one ounce jig. I would have in the, in that bag. Um, I would have some tubes. I, that's another bait. In fact, I almost listed this as my go-to bait, and that's a that's just a, a tube fished. Uh, well, again, you can do a lot of things with it, but fished on a Texas rig is my favorite way to fish a tube. Um, so I would I would have make sure I had some tubes with me. I would have some uh, square bill crankbaits with me, and I would have a top water like a super spook with me. Those are those are some baits that I never go anywhere without. Um, you always want to make sure you take your pair of pliers. Always want to make sure you take your scissors. That's something else that's going to be in my backpack. Um, spare spool of line, a hook sharpener, uh, some polarized sunglasses, uh, a little first aid kit, just something small that's got some, some band-aids and or, or even some liquid bandage in, something like that. Right, right. Uh, just, just in case uh, one of those hooks ends up in my, in my <laughs> leg or something. Well, um, to kind of piggyback off what you just said, two things. You're, you said you're using square bills. Now, are these, uh, would, would you, for Lake Amistad, uh -huh. we, you said we could catch them in the shallow water, but with these square bills, would you want the deep diver square bills or would you want to have it in the near the top of the lake for these five foot divers or those eight foot divers? Yeah, I would use more of a traditional, if I'm, you know, again, I'm just thinking things I always have with me. Right, right. So the bigger square bills and the deeper square, square bills, square bills are more um, unusual situation baits for me. Usually if I want to fish a crankbait deeper, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a more traditional deep diving crankbait. Right, know, right. A fat free shad or a Rapala a DT 10 or DT 12 or whatever, you know, something that goes deeper. So, but a square bill is, is one of those baits that almost any lake you go to, you can catch some fish on it um, shallow. I don't care where you go or what time of year it is. You can almost always catch some fish. Just get on a, find a rock bank and go parallel with a square bill. You know, that's a, that's a good, good formula to get a bite. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so one thing I have, a, not really a hard time wrapping, wrapping my head around, but I don't, not ne I don't necessarily understand how you, how you become a professional bass fisherman. Like when in your, when in your life did you actually realize like, okay, like, I'm a professional bass fisherman. Like this is this is it. Yeah. Well, so it was a dream of mine before it was a reality. Um, my grandfather back in about 1970. I was born in '63, so I was when I was seven years old. He bought me a subscription to Bassmaster magazine, and I started reading about uh, these guys that were having bass tournaments. I, I mean, bass fishing was already something I loved to do. Right. But they were comparing their catches and making money doing it. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> And, um, you know, so it, it was always a dream of mine to do it. Um, you know, and I, I was fortunate that, you know, the Lord really helped work the circumstances in my life out in such a way that I, I was able to pursue that as a, as a career. Um, it wasn't until probably about 1990 that I would really consider myself a professional bass fisherman when I started fishing pro level circuits. For several years before that, I'd been fishing uh, statewide events around all over Texas and doing really well. Well, won a couple of anglers of years on like anglers choice team circuits. And I'd been fishing a lot of the red man uh, regional events and had one set, which is now like a, which would be like a Toyota series now. Right. Okay. Um, okay. And had won several of those, but I didn't really start fishing the major national tours until 1990. And uh, actually the first one I ever, I ever fished, I won. And um, then I just decided to, to go full time into fishing. Wow, that's. Um, but as far the other part of your question was, what does it mean to be a pro? Um, and I guess how to become a pro. Um, so what it means to be a pro is that you're deriving, or at least attempting to derive your entire livelihood off, or, you know, off of off of bass fishing. Right. Um, the best way to do it, uh, one, you need to have some talent. 
but you know, fishing talent and fishing is a little bit different than talent in football. I mean, there's some guys that are just born with that and other people that aren't, and no matter how much work they put into it, you know, they're, they're not going to be Dak Prescott or whoever It's just, they're just not going to be, uh, but fishing, you can, you can, there's skills that you can learn and develop. Now there still are natural instincts that some people have that other people just don't have. But a lot of that you can learn yourself. Um, you know, for me, a big, a big part of that was um, <clears throat> figuring out what God's will for my life was and, and realizing that he had a plan to use me in, in that role, you know, and I think that's important for anybody, no matter what you're going to do is to, is to do is, is to make sure that you're where you in your life, that you're where God wants you to be at that very moment. I think that's a really important part of it. Um, beyond that, it, you need to be fishing lots of tournaments. Uh, you need to have a really well-developed social media platform now. It used to not be that way. That's kind of a new thing. I mean, I've had to, had to learn that over the last five or six years because, you know, 10 years ago, social media as a bass fisherman didn't mean anything. It was all about the way you generated uh, press for your sponsors was you would win tournaments and then you would get interviewed by outdoor writers who would then write stories about you and your techniques and the lures you used in different publications. Whereas now you generate your own media content. And um, that's, that's a, a very important part of it. But uh, you really need to have a good combination of the tournament skills along with the social media, I think, to make it as a real success now. Right, right. Okay. That, that's, that's great to know. Because, you know, you know, fishing, honestly, is like, is my passion. Like, mm -hmm. like all I want to do pretty much when I wake up is just go fish. That's uh -huh. it. And so, and so being a professional bass fisherman is probably, is, is honestly a dream of mine. It's just fishing in general is just what I want to do with my life. So right. I just thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, also last question. I, um, this wasn't one of the questions just kind of popped up in my head, but in 2008, when you won the Bassmaster Classic in Lake Hartwell, when you, when you were prepared, did you do something different than you have been doing? Or how have you been, when you won that tournament, was there something else you changed that you were not wanting to do before? Or was it always just, just practice, keep the same, just keep, keep what you're doing? Well, uh, that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, it kind of, the way I, the way I'll lead into, into that is, um, you know, we've talked a lot about practice and preparation. Right. This right. Uh, practice for any tournament, uh, again, I'm going to say what I said earlier, that your preparation, your practice is more important than game day. And so on our practice days, you know, we're out on the water trying to figure out patterns, where the fish are, how deep they are, deep they are, and those type of things. Well, on that particular tournament, we had three days of practice. Day one of practice, I actually found um, the pattern early the first day of practice that was the winning pattern. And it was a very deep water pattern. I was catching bass in 35 to 50 feet of water uh, on the bottom with the jig, uh, you know, fishing down like the bottoms of these little clay drains. It was kind of an unusual pattern, but it was, right, it was a dead right. wintertime type of a pattern. But what that allowed me to do by figuring it out early in practice was it allowed me to spend three full days of practice um, duplicating similar spots to that okay and, so, and that's really what you're trying to do you it, that's what, when you say develop a pattern it means you're trying to find something duplicatable that you can do here 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 and here and go do the same thing in all those places and have success and a lot of times you may find another spot just like one that's working and it's not working and another one just like that one that's not working then all of a sudden you find another one boom they're here again so you're trying to put yourself together like a little milk run of places that you can run and have have success right um you know but had i not had i not found that pattern until the final day of practice i would have probably done pretty good in the tournament but i wouldn't have had enough spots located right, right. in that event okay. you know so so um it's it's been able to dial in quickly and then then really be diligent during that practice time to know what you're searching for and go find as much of it as you can um you know and that was um that was key for me winning that tournament right right and i think the uh 
the, uh, the, the key slogan for this interview would be practice makes perfect. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. And so I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. It, it, it literally means the world to me that you're talking to me right now. I was, I was show, showing all my friends and they were freaking out. So thank you so uh, much. And uh, I hope you have a great day. Hey, this is my pleasure, Nick. It's, it, I, I really enjoyed uh, getting to know you here and uh, be sure and, uh, and, uh, and give Jason a hard time for me. <laughs> I will for sure. I will for sure. Thank you so much. Thank uh -huh. you.